I was born in the military. It's in Zimbabwe. I stayed there for about two years, and then my father passed, and then I moved off to Ireland. I don't really remember them. There's pictures that my mom has somewhere around, but I don't really feel close to him at all. I feel more close to my stepdad, Dermot. This house was my first home in Ireland, and it means a lot to me. My mom, she was just looking for a single room to rent, and Dermot took her in. And then when I came over, after six months of my mom being here, this man that I've never met before, I was just like, who's he? I don't think I liked him very much. No matter how many times he'd walk in the door, I would say, he's back again, ma'am, he's back again. That man is back again. My mom would just be like, shh. This is his house. I just started to grow into him. I just started to like him more and more. The house was empty until me and my mom came. It was just all blank. And then everything just started to grow, like pictures of me, pictures of my mom, like accomplishments. After a long time, Dermot proposed to my mom and they got married. And then it became our house, my house, his house, our house. Like now that I'm older, like I can see my mom sacrificed a lot. She could have left me in Zimbabwe. She could have had a fresh start, but instead she said no. And now I'm over here living in this house. This house is where everything happened. Zimbabwe is where I was born. Ireland is my home. In the summer, the caravans used to be brilliant. In the winter, it was that cold that you could draw pictures on the side of the windy with the ice. But in the summer, it used to be really like not long evenings and the sky does be shattered pink. It does be like we're at home, like look at. You make most of what you have inside of a caravan. It's very very claustrophobic, but then it's not as if you've moved from a big mansion. You never had the space to actually miss it. I have two younger brothers and two younger sisters. Growing up was hectic. Hectic. When we were younger, four of us used to sleep in my bed. And we used to chat about everything. What we're going to be when we're growing up. And... Silly things, really. I look back at them like, what did I want to be? An arse. I never got that. Someday, hopefully. It's different for a boy and a girl, I think. In the travel community. Like a boy can come and go and party and drink and whatever you want for it, but a girl just has to have a good name before she goes. Some people actually get from the father to a stricter husband. It's going from one deal to another. I left that mix about 97, 98. There was feuding in Donnerick's, and everybody left. There's no caravans there anymore. When you live in a travel site, you know everyone. If anything went wrong, because you have someone to turn to, it's more security, more like, it's home, really. I wouldn't like living in a settled person's house to me, but you isolated. We were all born at home upstairs in the back bedroom. Home sweet home, literally, you know. It was purchased by my father and his brother in 1939. And I remember being quite small and seeing my um, uncle serving Guinness, hearing music and just the, the whole area, a forest of people. It was a family business, so it was all hands on deck. We had two days off a year, Christmas and um, Good Friday. The pub was across the road from the Clare Champion office, so all the journalists drank there. I hear passionate discussion about ideas, about books, about history. I remember in 1968 there was a film made in Ennis um, called Guns in the Heather and Kurt Russell used to come up to the bar and my uh, sister kind of um, fancied him. And then at the same time down to Conda there was the farmer in from the mart with shit all over his boots. My bedroom 
that was my escape. I'd go up there and I'd draw. Art was always a tangible thing for me. I'd never been to an art gallery. The art that I saw was pictures of saints in various people's houses. I drew a lot of uh, customers in the bar. I remember in secondary school, the teacher's feeling fellas whose parents owned the pub, there was no need for them to be wasting time in school. I didn't take it personally because I had a strong feeling that I had a commitment to another area. I wasn't going to be limited by the bar. Getting a place in art college was an opportunity that I didn't hesitate in taking. There was a other world out there that was calling me. This house is actually my mother's family home. She was born here in Gretna Goppel. Her mom and her dad were both from Gretna Goppel. Daddy moved here then after marrying mommy. They chose this to be the family home and they were just seven kids here. Well, in Ishmore, it's just magical. It's, I'm privileged to have grown up here. Of course, uh, it's a small island, but I think it's like anywhere, if you keep to yourself, if you mind your own business, you know, it doesn't become claustrophobic. It's a good motto in life, I guess, just mind your own. <laughs> you always bring your work home with you. You just do. It's quite evident that a fisherman lived here. <laughs> quite evident. The first time I was ever on a fishing boat, I was precisely one week old. I came home and my dad's boat, the Fort Angus. I started fishing when I was 17. I really, really, really fell for it. Had I not gone fishing that summer, I would probably have ended up getting a job someplace on the mainland and possibly abroad. So something was calling me back. Dad now wouldn't have made any distinction between me and my brothers. I guess in a way it was, it was nice for him to see another family member join the family business. I think he may have been a bit proud. <laughs> I hope I made him proud, actually. Unfortunately, Daddy passed away in February, which was desperate, actually, for us all. His presence is still very strong here in the family home. Knots that he would have tied or plenty of pictures of him around and my beautiful baby daughter, Leah, Sometimes I look at her and she's got the same piercing blue eyes as my dad did. My mother had almost concealed from her parents that she was pregnant to the last minute. Her mother must have clocked something. A girl of 18, starting life, just passed her exams to go to university and to be clobbered with somebody coming along that wasn't planned. Must have been horrific. And even that, she still wanted to keep me, but she wasn't allowed. My mother's mother would have seen the local vicar and he then arranged for my mother to be sent to the Bethany home in Dublin. She had to spend four months in the Bethany home prior giving birth and four and a half months after. That was a punishment for girls getting pregnant in the Protestant system at that time. Then my mother would have gone home and life would have took up from where she left off. Once your mother left, you got what was called lottery service. Sometimes you were fed, sometimes you weren't. Sometimes you was washed and, and most times you weren't. There's images in my head of cots and darting, things darting around them. But now I know that that was children screaming to have the nappies changed, screaming to have some sort of care. There's a sort of a smell in my nose that I've never forgotten. It's, it's, <laughs> Those sort of things that are there, and you can't explain them, but you've been affected by it. 
there was 219 unmarked graves. And that's from 19 and 22 to 19 and 49. And most of those children died of starvation and through lack of care. It had an impact on my life right through. I left for England when I was 18. And I have no doubt in my mind that when I left, my, my brain would have been suppressed to, a, say, a 12-year-old. It took me many, many, many years to get to where I am today. Well, it's home. <laughs> I know every room, every picture, every bit of furniture, every book. It always feels cosy, cosy home. When the war broke out, my mother went to America. So I was born in America. We couldn't get back here soon enough. And I remember going up the stairs, the schoolroom at the top. So this is home. <laughs> my father did a lot of writing at his desk in the library. Well, he really very seldom spoke to us. Because my mother would come for walks. She was rather beautiful, uh, had long golden hair down to her knees. We did what we liked, really. Unending bicycle rides, fishing for pike on the lake. Then uh, there'd be tennis in the summer on the tennis court. Half past seven, Gong would go and be changed for dinner. There was quite a big staff, most of them from the village here. My grandmother could choose pretty girls to be housemaids, handsome boys to be footmen. <laughs> Master Jack, I was called. Here comes Master Jack. People said one day it will all be yours, you know. Just took it for granted. Our dining room would hold six of the little cottages that were around here. There. And I used to say to the people, would you like to live in the castle? Sure, what would I do with the castle? was the answer. <laughs> Always leaks. Yes, unending repairs would all go through the balance sheet once a year. There was always a debit and borrowing from the bank. Well, we started taking and paying guests, so it just grew from that. Well, I'd like to carry on, I can carry on now. <laughs> I don't see any point for a change. I take tours around, people who want to see the house. Plenty happening, plenty to do. No, no need for change now. <laughs> 